Welcome, Welcome to Pushing the Limits, the podcast that gets deep into the psyche of extraordinary achievers across all genres, cutting to the chase to unlock the secrets of their success, their achievement, philosophies, and motivations. Join us in the quest to find out what makes the movers and shakers of our world tick and what gems of wisdom we can learn from them. Well, hi everybody, it's Lisa Tamati here at Pushing the Limits. So cool to be back in the saddle here and I've got a wonderful guest for you today. You're going to be just really uh, enthralled by her story and what she's been through and what she's come through um, and I'm really looking forward to interviewing her. But before we do, I wanted to ask you all a big favour as I do at the beginning of my podcast. Um, as you know, uh, podcasts live and die by their ratings and reviews so I really appreciate you, you guys doing me a huge favour and going on to iTunes especially um, and giving us a rating and review. Obviously a five star would be fantastic and subscribing of course and um, you know if you, if you like the content and you find it valuable it would be fantastic if you could share it too with your networks. I'd really really appreciate that. So thanks very much guys in advance for doing that and now we're going to have a wonderful guest, an Australian lady by the name of Kate Sanderson is joining me today and Kate has a really amazing story. She's, of course, um, the fourth in my series of inspirational woman athletes, and her story is a little bit different than the others. Um, so welcome to the show, Kate. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's, it's very cool to have you, love. Um, so we've had a little bit of dramas, Kate and I. We've been fighting our way through technology dramas, so <laughs> we hope that it's going to work, but um, we'll give it a go. So, Kate, firstly, um, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you were born, where you grew up, and what sort of kid you were, and, and then we'll get on to a little bit about your, your athletic career. Oh, wow. I, I was actually born in Scotland but moved to Australia when I was one, Mm -hmm. Um, grew up, so my only child, which I say it's a license to be weird. I, I do <laughs> consider myself a little bit odd and just always seem to go against the grain of the status quo and everything. Um, I, I was a little brat growing up. I was climbing trees and always getting myself into trouble. My poor mum. <laughs> um, sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe not for mum, but, um, but no, it was, um, always quite quite sporty and athletic and I was always into everything um and I guess I guess later on in life I finished high school uh didn't do anything for sort of sporty for 10 years and then sort of rediscovered sport in maybe sort of 2004 and I guess I started getting into my first taste of anything of a big distance was Sydney Oxfam Trail Walker oh, in about fabulous. 2004, yeah. Yeah, that's a great way to enter the world of craziness, isn't it? <laughs> well, it is, and I, and I had no idea these things existed before then. Mm. I, I was doing my 5K fun runs, and uh, I'm not built for speed. <laughs> I, hey, I don't, you, and I, me, you and me both, sister. <laughs> yeah, I just don't enjoy going as fast as I can, you know, yeah. pounding the pavement. And when I discovered... I did the trail walk. I, I was like, oh, my God, how long has this been around? This is me. <laughs> this is, you found home, in other words. You oh, really found yeah. home. Yeah, I totally Definitely. get it. <laughs> it's yeah. like, hey, you 5K runners, you might be able to fly past me on that 5K run, but hey, <laughs> see, see if you can keep up after 100 or 200. <laughs> I know, but the funny thing is I didn't finish Oxfam, the trail walker. I got to, I think it was 90 two kilometers oh. and my whole team had pulled out along the way oh. <laughs> and I didn't want to do the last 7k by myself so I just okay I'll just pull out as well oh. and then it bugged me every single day until I went back the next year and finished it it <laughs> really bugged me um and that was my entry into it after then I, I knew I could actually finish it um yeah. So you were you one of those stubborn people that had, you know, because you had a bit of unfinished business. And obviously, yeah, when, when everyone else pulls out and you're still like, even when it's only seven or eight Ks, but believe me, people sitting out there have never done an ultra, even seven or eight Ks from the finish line is an eternity eh, when, you're, when you're out there oh, and you're yeah. absolutely, when you're absolutely toast and you've lost all your mates and it's like, oh, this is all new territory. Um, yeah, it was it was so easy to pull out, and yeah. I convinced myself that oh yeah, I couldn't go on. But yep. afterwards, and for the next three hundred and sixty four days until, <laughs> until it came up again, I knew I could do it. I was like, of course I can do it. It's seven kilometers, yep. and you know, 
and, and that's how I've just gone into these events and, and managed to finish them, knowing that when you think you can't, you actually can. You actually can take another step. And that, you know, you also learn, I think, when you pull out of something like that is that failure hurts, you know. It might, it's, it's a relief in the first moment when you go, and sometimes, like, you know, let's be honest, you need to pull out because it's ridiculous. You've injured yourself or you're really sick or, you know, I'm not saying don't pull out. But sometimes it's just a psychological, I I'm just can't cope anymore. And if, you yeah. sat, if you'd sat down for half an hour and had a hot cup of soup or something, you might have, you know, pulled through and, and come out the other end. And, and um, you know, that, that, that failure can, like you say, haunt you for the next, you know, 365 days until you actually went back and you have to do the whole damn thing again which is yeah I, I, I totally I totally agree I totally agree <laughs> yeah like I um have a story like that from my husband actually doing a 100k at Northburn and um it was his first attempt at doing 100k and he'd only ever done 150 before that and that wasn't in the mountains and he got to the 70k and he was going pretty slow you know he's not not fast either and he got up there and he basically just freaked himself out because it was dark, it was freezing cold, it was like the black as the inside of a cow and, and he just basically freaked himself out, you know, and he was exhausted, of course, but he wasn't exhausted to the point that he really had to pull. Um, and, uh, you know, that sort of, that bugged him, you know, like if he, if he pushed through, you know, he would have made it. It would have been a slow race and, and hellish, especially with the, the weather and the stuff up there. Um, yeah. But sometimes you're just like, oh, damn, it would all be over now and I'd have my medal, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> oh, so that was your first one and then you went back the following year. So you didn't do anything in between that? Um, I can't Nothing. actually remember. But yep. after then, I pro like I've probably done maybe 20 to 30 ultra marathons. So from, you know, wow. the 50K to 100K. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I just loved it. And and um as I say, I'm not built for speed. I'm not talented. I'm no one special. I just turned up <laughs> and I was always at the back. I was never at the pointy end of the field. Yep. And I just ran my own race and just just loved it. Oh, awesome. And so what was your you did the the Oxfam again the next year with a team as well and 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 pulled through that one? Yeah, different team. And so after that it was probably six or seven years of doing events and finishing every, every single one of them. I never wow. had any failures. And I think that's because I'm not a person that wears a GPS and a heart rate monitor and, and analyzes <laughs> the stats. So I kind of had no pressure. I just would turn up. Yep. I, you know, I really didn't, you know, do five minute Ks and, you know, I had yep. all, never had anything in my head than just get to the next checkpoint, get to the next checkpoint. And so um, I just enjoyed it. I think because I had no pressure and my goal was just to finish and I didn't care the time or actually I did have a little thing about coming last, <laughs> but, yep. but that, you know, that that's my own little hang up. Yep. Um, yeah. And, and I, for the, so many years, I actually completed all these events and it gave me so much confidence in uh, myself. It, isn't it amazing what it can do? And I mean, it, it really can transform lives. The, the, you suddenly realize, hey, crikey, I can do so much more than what I ever, ever imagined possible. And, and it sort of becomes like, I know for me it was like, well, what, what's next? How far can I really go? You know, where, where, yeah. where is the limit? And then, you know, you crash and burn a few times as well along the way. But yeah. Um, did you find having like a, a team, like I've always found, like I did the Oxfam Trail Walker one year as well, like um, just just with a, with a few other ladies, and I found that really quite hard because you you've got to pace with the other ones, and when one's down, the other one's up, and you know when you've got four of you, it's a recipe for um, your undoing because someone is always about to fall to pieces. You know? Yeah, I think I've actually come full circle at the start. Um, I was unstoppable and so team events did kind of irk me a little bit and yep. I think I was a lot younger and a bit more uh, not self-centered but just focused on myself and yep. if someone was lagging I guess I wouldn't have didn't have great empathy <laughs> so, yep. so um, but you know I always stayed with the team and whatever and then I went off and did a lot of solo events um and one of my trail walker experiences, I 
was in – I had a bad experience where the three girls ran up on me. Oh, And yep. then I basically did 70Ks by my by, – literally by myself. Yep. Uh, and I'd come in to a checkpoint and they'd be waiting for me and we'd check in and they'd run off again. And so – to a degree, the tables were turned and I knew what it felt, felt like. like. Yeah. And then it's bloody hard, I've come eh? full circle. <laughs> yeah. It's deflating. It's demoralizing. It, it's just makes yep. you feel awful. And yep. now I've come full circle where I really do like the solo events. I like being out by myself uh, for hours without seeing no one. But I now appreciate team events and once you sign up to a team event you've got to be committed and in the mindset that it's not all about you yes yeah yeah and it it teaches you a whole new gambit of of skills I think when you when you you have to get through together and it teaches you to be more caring and more empathetic and more um focused on other people and not just your own selfish goals and it can be quite infuriating when you're fast Faster than everyone else, it's infuriating. When you're the slowest, it's huge pressure, you know. Yes. So it can yeah. be really, really tough on on the on the slowest one because they feel like the, the complete numpty and everyone else is just waiting for me all the time, and and that pressure can be you know immense. So there's always that. There, there's the advantages and the disadvantages. Like on a lot of the multi-day stage races that I that I did, I would always um get really scared on the long day because I knew that we'd be going through the night and you were in some weird yeah. place in the middle of the Sahara or Gobi or somewhere. And um, so always on that day, I tried to team up with some person. Um, and one of your actually fellow Australian woman, crazy runners, Sam Gash, and I've teamed up a couple of times <laughs> and in uh, the Gobi in the Sahara. And, you know, that was a really bonding experience that we went through together, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we went to hell and back. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but we went there together, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it, but it was, it was tough. I remember in the Sahara race we had another guy, Manus, and, a, and one of his friends, Dave, and Dave couldn't keep up because he had a knee injury and we had to let, you know, him drop out the back. And it was just the three of us and Manus was just absolutely amazing. I remember at about a, the 99-kilometre mark when we had 111 or something to do. And um, it being an absolute, my back my back had gone because I got a really bad back, and I couldn't bend over to I empty my shoe out with the sand, you know. <laughs> and this such a gentleman of a guy, you know. He he got down on his hands and knees and he pulled my shoes off and he emptied the shoes. You know, we were absolutely <laughs> knackered, all of us, you know, and put it back on my foot. And I just thought, you're a legend, you know. <laughs> some, some little thing wow. like that, you know. That's and lovely. It's a it's a lovely little story, eh? but there's lots of those little stories that you have, and you must have experienced that sort of stuff too. Oh, most definitely, and the camaraderie. And sometimes you'll be you'll be running along, and you don't know this person, but somehow you feel that yep. you you can tell them all about your life and you yeah. know, all these things that you don't <laughs> even sort of even talk about in the open or whatever. And all of a sudden, you've told someone all these like <laughs> inner thoughts and whatever. And it's, it's just funny, this yeah. weird, it's, isn't it? It's yeah. just weird, yeah. but it's exhilarating. I think it, you know, because you you just stripped beer. And I think yes. that's the that's the um, the most cleansing and cathartic and amazing and real a real human experience. All the bullshit, all the uh, plastic society that we live in, all the you know all of this you know sort of plastic world and everything, and we we don't get to know each other on a real human, vulnerable, deep level. Um, yeah. And we do when you're out there in the middle of. Timbuktu somewhere and you're fighting for your life or you're fighting for a race you know sometimes it is survival <laughs> um, as you well know as we'll get to shortly um, and you do get to know people on a different level and you might not even remain friends forever but you, you had a really deep connection for right sure. then and there and you can tell you, you know I, yeah, I mean I shouldn't be telling my stories but I remember running along in Niger and I had food poisoning and like my, my guts was doing things that you know you don't want to know about and I had to go to the loo every five minutes and I'm running along next to this very handsome young English guy and he had the same problem so we were just you know next sitting next to each other shitting away <laughs> and, <laughs> and laughing our heads off about it you know well what else do you do you know the, the your dignity is completely gone <laughs> um, <laughs> And you just well, get on with it, you know? Yeah, and that's exactly right. When I, I did a marathon to Saab a few years ago, I, I was 
so anxious about what am I going to do for a toilet? There's no <laughs> trees, there's no bushes, and I'm going to have to bring my own little tree with me or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the, the first few days, you kind of you try and do your best to disguise you know, yourself and go off where no one can see. And after, or by <laughs> towards the end of it, you kind of take three steps off the trail and just squat, <laughs> and you don't care. It's you so just don't true. care. And the tighter you get, like it, it, you know, people are always going off. Uh, you know, a fair way from camp to do their business. By the end, everyone's just squatting yeah. in the back of the tent. I think nowadays they've got, like, when I did my first ones, they didn't even have, a, you know, a toilet designated area. Now they just, you know, back then we just, like, squatted <laughs> behind the tent and came back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and it is all those little experiences where, you, you know, you, you can't really hide that, yeah, we're all human. No. <laughs> Yep, exactly right. <laughs> and it's quite hilarious and embarrassing. And it's especially hard for women, I think. You know, we've got, um, yep. you know, it's, it's quite, you know, guys can at least, you know, just hang it out and do. <laughs> we try our best. Yeah. <laughs> you think, I, could, I could seriously write a whole book on toilet stories. You know, <laughs> what to do and what not to yeah, do. Yeah, <laughs> the situations I've gotten myself into or other people have gotten themselves into, but we won't go there. It's probably yeah. enough said about that. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, let's let's look at, so Marathon de Sables, did that come on uh, fairly early on in the piece or um, in your uh, ultra career? No, that, w- that was only a couple of years ago. Um, and that, that was sort of after my accident. So that was oh, an event okay. I always so, wanted to do. Yeah. So let's yeah. well, let's backtrack a little bit. Is there anything in between, so 2004, your first Oxfam, and then doing um, sort of lots of local sort of Australian 50Ks and, and 100Ks, that type of thing? Yeah, I did a lot of that, and I didn't know anybody. And I was debilitatingly shy when I was young, mm. Um, mm. and I'm still, I'm still quite shy and an introvert now. And so I don't know what... I really wanted to do these events, but geez, it terrified me just to t- drive two or three hours to the start of some race and mm. start in the start line and you know no one and oh, just oh. used to be sitting in my car just going <laughs> chit, 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 chit. <laughs> but everybody was lovely and once the race started, you're on your own and you're in your own little world and um, I just loved it and being a bit of a lone wolf, it suited me great. Like it's it's just so connected I just feel so connected and and to 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 the trails and you know the outdoors and it it just suited me fine so yeah I I was off everywhere doing these events and I'm absolutely loving them and then I got to I don't know learn to read a map and and just all these other skills that came with it and just being um, conscious of your environment and you know you've got to turn left down here or whatever and I just loved every single aspect of it yeah, and it teaches you so much. Uh, and I think, you know, like you said, you found home when you found these long-distance events and you find that that the people out there, like we said, is the camaraderie is, is just so different than, say, heading off to the local marathon in the city or, yeah. or any of that type of races. Um, and even people who, you know, have difficulty, who are shy, who are introverted, feel quite accepted in, in, in places like in ultra races, I, I find. Um, because it's just, there's, there's no sort of measuring, there's no, there's no sort of, you know, measuring contest. Well, there is in the, in the, the elite field, I suppose, but for most people, it's all about, well, you know, how they, we're all scared, <laughs> shitless, and, yeah, and how yeah. we're going to get through this. And, and what's exactly. It, yeah. How are you exactly. feeling? You know, you yeah, could just, you could be on the start line in, at any event and just turn to your right or your left and yeah. just strike up a conversation. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, it's just such a good feeling. Yeah. And I bet that helped massively with, you know, being shy, um, you know, and even in the rest of your life, did you find that it was easier then to, to talk to other people and feel confident in who you were? Yeah, and I think what ultra running gave me was a lot of, oh, you're not even aware of it. You just gain this confidence in all aspects of your life and then you're confident in yourself and the ability to to run further and then, you know, that translates into just normal life as well. And I think so much of it is just it's an undercurrent and you don't know, but it, it shapes you. And I, I, was, I really do believe that personal growth happens you know, only like truly when you push your boundaries and go mm. out of your comfort zone yep. and all of a sudden I am the person I am. And I definitely owe it just a lot to, to being on my own, ultra running, just, just connecting 
with the outdoors. Yeah, absolutely. And I think nature has a way of just calming you down too and, and making, you know, like just making you feel like we should do as humans. I think, you know, once again, we, we, we're so shut off from, from nature so, so much of the time in our houses yeah. and our offices and our cars. And, and so many people, I think, have, you know, issues with, you know, psychological issues, depression and all that, because one of the, one of the things, I think, is because we're not connected to Mother Nature. We're not touching the earth. We're not hearing the sea. We're not up in the mountains and seeing nature and animals. And, you know, you can't, I don't think you can spend a real day out in nature and not feel connected you know um yeah I know and then a lot of people like um some people I know they love marathons and running on the road and and that that's fine you know and their goal is to shave you know a second off here and 10 seconds off here and um I guess you really can't compare when you run on a trail you know there's so many different elements and the weather and there might be a flood or you know something but you know the point of it is just I just love being out there and just 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 feeling connected and I could run a race and by the end of it I had no idea what I thought about for that whole 10 hours or whatever it just <laughs> you just you're just in the zone you're just in the moment and it's great yeah yeah and it's a it's a, 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 a day so that even though you like you don't remember everything but the days that you never forget like the entire experience itself oh um, yeah yeah and, you know like every other day work days and normal days they all sort of run into one and they're nothing special um and when you have days where you're actually really alive like you might be scared and nervous and exhausted and tot and tired and everything but you're really living you're really actually experiencing emotions and experiencing and that makes your memory so strong of it Um, yeah I totally agree yeah so like how how um so you let's move on to um your accident because this must have completely absolutely shattered and for a while and then changed your whole life um tell us what happened there so um in september 2011 i was running in an ultra marathon in the kimberleys in western australia and uh well it was a hundred kilometer event and we're about 25 kilometers into it and uh we were unaware there was a bushfire had started up somewhere in the proximity and so it got to about 25 kilometers and we entered a gorge there was a few of us in the gorge and I just remember looking up at some stage and just saw this wall of fire coming down the gorge oh. and um oh. it turns out that I mean there was six of us in the gorge at the time and we just couldn't escape because there was sort of yeah. there was a uh, rock walls on both sides and but all of us we had time to sort of I only knew one of the people, Hal, at the time, and yep. we all bunched up and it's like, gee, what are we going to do? And the options were run up one of the hills on the one on the right-hand side or run back in front of the fire, and oh. you're not supposed to do either in a fire. So we thought, well, we'll run up the hill because maybe yep. there's a road up there or something. So Yeah, maybe you can get high, away from Yeah, that. Yeah, okay. so we started running up the hill, and then I thought, oh, I'll put my long sleeve merino top on that I had in my bag. Yeah. Because that will protect me. But by the time I, I got it out and, you know, I just put it on and I looked behind me and the fire, as soon as it hit the hill, just sped oh, up. Shit. And yeah. so I was the first burnt. So there was four of us burnt. Oh. And myself and Taria was 60% burnt. Um, the oh. two boys that were burnt, they actually jumped back into the fire and through the fire, which was probably a good idea. You know, they were 20% burnt and um, the other so, two guys didn't get burnt at all. So they so they actually ran back into like, and through. So did the fire, I mean, I've never seen, obviously, a, a forest fire of any sort. Um, is it like a wall and behind it it's burnt out and you can run through it type thing? Um, um, yeah, so the idea is if you, if you can literally make it to the burnt area, You'll, you'll be technically okay. escape the fire. Yeah, so they jumped through the wall of flames wow. um, and, yeah, sort of got burnt that way. But, geez, it was a good option if I yeah. thought of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Who's, you're wise afterwards, eh? I mean, who, knows, oh, yeah. who the hell knows what to do? And What were you, like, when this wall of fire is coming at you guys, 
Were you, were you panicking? Were you absolutely thinking this is it? We're going to die, or what uh, was going no. through your head? When we were on the 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 gorge on the floor, no, we we're all like, oh, what should we do? Yeah, well, let's go up here. And it didn't really occur to me that we were in that danger. We just thought we'd get up to the top of the hill and maybe if we get over the hill, there's either a road or fire won't travel down a hill fast. So, but then I was just shocked. I didn't have much time to think by the time the fire, by the time I put on my long sleeve top yep. and I just hid behind a rock because it was seconds away. And then I just started to, I started to burn and the fire hadn't even hit yet. It was Whoa. just the radiant heat. The so, heat. Yeah, I got up and I just remember uh, screaming and I just had this thought, this is what it's like to die in a fire. Like I oh. did not think I would live. I just no. knew I was going to die. And then oh. because we were on a hill, I'd, I lost my balance and I fell and I just remember just rolling and rolling and rolling and I'm just assuming oh, that man. extinguished the fire. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, it- and then I just, just stood up and I just – didn't know what to do and I was just in shock so I just must have stood there for a while and then my friend Hal who wasn't burnt he reappeared and he looked at me and I could tell by the look on his face yeah, that I trouble. was badly burnt yep oh, it, it, it's, it's you know it's unfathomable for us I mean just picturing the horror of it and is it like um is it that such that you're in so much shock that you don't feel anything much for starters and you don't actually look as bad as it's what, what's going to get? You know, like you see um, sometimes burn victims in the moment don't look as bad as what they do like a month later in the rehabilitation, like the skin's really peeling off and doing everything it does. Yeah, I could see my hands and my, my thighs because I was wearing shorts I could see that the layers were, were totally gone. Oh. Um, I, I didn't feel the pain immediately, but it's a it's kind of a, a long, complex situation. But yeah. it took us yeah. four hours to get rescued because um, there That's was no horrific. yeah there was no radio communication out there. So you know our whistles and you know we weren't allowed to take uh, any sort of communication devices, which wouldn't have worked anyway. Yeah. Um, and then there's a bit of chaos because no one knew what was going on or where the runners were and the helicopters couldn't land on the floor because it was burnt. And so by the end of it, I could definitely feel the pain. Oh, <laughs> so, oh, four hours, the shock's gone. Yeah, cause it, and it was 30 degrees as well. So oh. it was, it was yeah, it was so not dehydration great. dehydration and, and hours. like what, I mean, um, and I know Turia's story obviously is, is similar. Um, yeah. And, and it, it's, is it, you know, like horrific? And, I mean, we can't imagine how horrific it must be. Like, to, what was going on with the organisation? Like, run the planet, um, racing the planet, sorry. What, what the hell were they doing? What, you know, did, did it ever come out? What exactly, you know, how, they, how could they have mismanaged it so badly? But uh, I guess it's all debatable, but at the end of the day, I just passed the second checkpoint, or most of us had, and we we literally got sent into a fire. And the but the people at the checkpoint weren't aware of it as well. We weren't aware of it, but the organisers were uh, oh. knew there was a fire in their proximity. So it was just. And it was oh, just a shocking. bit of comedy of errors getting everyone off the course. I think we got burnt at about one and that the race wasn't uh, called off until six. Um, and oh, it was that's really a, bad, badly managed. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and they've got, you know, a very bad reputation from this event. I mean, I've done some of their races, two of their races. Um, the one in the Gobi Desert, we, you know, we lost a guy there as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and at the time I was doing a documentary and I wasn't allowed to actually talk about it. Um, you can see me bawling my eyes out on the doc- documentary because at that stage he was in a coma and then yeah. he died a-, a couple of days later and that was totally mismanaged as well. Um, you know, the, the, he, he was uh, heat exhaustion and dehydration. It collapsed in this really um, uh, tight ravine, like it was like a slot canyon and the, yeah. heat, the heat coming through there was just insane. And this guy wasn't really prepared. He wasn't as fit as he possibly 
should have been. Uh, collapsed, didn't have enough water on him. We don't know all the, all the details. But some, one of the runners found him unconscious with hardly any pulse. They ran to the you know, finish line. Uh, and some runners immediately said, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go, you know, we'll go and get him. You know, we'll just run back up and we'll get him. And the, yeah. the organisers said, no, we've got to get the doctors up there. We've got to take camels up there. And, of course, the doctors aren't athletes. And it took two hours for them to organise mm. themselves. Meanwhile, this guy's toast, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and they wouldn't let the runners go and get him. And, and the runners could have got up there because they couldn't get vehicles to this, through the Slot Canyon. Um, and they, they could have got there. Maybe we don't know whether they would have saved him or not, but I think they would have had a hell of a lot more chance because they would have at least been able to get him down. And, and the runners were prepared to sacrifice their race, do whatever, you know, get the man down. And on that day, you know, there was about was five or six runners who were in deep, deep trouble. Um, uh, and, yeah, so I'm not very, <laughs> um, not very pleased with them. And, uh, yeah, yeah uh, their safety like I, I don't is just not I wish them any malice and I, I don't want to speak badly of them. I don't agree with how they handled things and I wish we got some sort of an apology or an acknowledgement mm. of some sort. At, at but, least that, yeah. Yeah, you know, it just shows, you know, if that's the people they are, that's fine and they're probably protecting their brand or whatever. <laughs> you know, I just I just didn't want to waste my energy. I just wanted to move on with my own recovery by that time. Yeah, of course. I mean, you're fighting for your life now. Um, so when they did finally get you out and the four hours were passed and you had 60% of your body burnt, what parts were really burnt um, in, in your case, Kate? So my whole body was burnt so my torso was the only thing that survived so I so when I went back to the Alfred hospital in I was flying back to to Melbourne where I live and when we had to do skin grafts they all they could harvest off my body was from my torso so I was in there for a prolonged time because they would take what they could uh, and they'd have to wait three weeks for the skin to go back before they could take it again and again and so um, I did have some donor skin as well yep. um but yeah so all my arms all my legs um my oh. i saved my face to a degree um even though it is still a bit um patchy and everything but i i guess i i, I saved my face and lost my fingers so i have my fingers yeah uh, however i put my hands to my face and my tendons burnt off oh. so when i looked at my hands there was all these black strips on my fingers and i actually didn't know or even thought about what that was until I was at the Alfred and they said, Kate, that's your tendons. You oh, don't... my God. You've got no so, more tendons. They're burnt, literally burnt off. Yeah, so, so you know, I should be thankful I have my fingers because, you know, most yeah. of Terea's fingers, you know, she doesn't have hers, but yep. they're, few, they're fused in a fixed position. But that's that's fine. I'm thankful for that. So you can, yeah, so you can, I mean, you can do still a lot with your hands or... You oh know, yeah, like, like writing you know, and, and things like that, and picking picking things up and stuff. Yeah, sort of micro skills. I do get frustrated at times. You're like handling money and buttons and yep. things, but I've just it's my new normal. So yep. Yep. I've just got to be thankful for what I have. And oh, you're incredible. Same oh. with my foot. Like I've I lost half my left foot, um, <laughs> but I have a brace. I've always got the option of having a below knee amputation, which my surgeons are pushing for, but. Oh. Um, you know, I can walk, I can't run anymore, but there's so many events out there that I can still walk and be within cutoff. So, oh, and and, you're incredible. I think, you know, that's, that's just amazing that you could, um, even consider going back out there. I think most people would be going like, hell no, not after experiencing some, something as scary and as frightening as that. Uh, yeah, that I'll born with my fair share of stubbornness yeah, and so you're I lucky. think that you're plays lucky. a lot of yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I think that, that that's probably what's why you've survived this whole horrific journey because you have to be really stubborn and, and hardcore to get through something like that like um and in Taria as well like you know total amazing yeah. respect um absolutely love what she does and who you know what she's um done and and everything and I just totally, you know, I think for us who have never experienced anything that horrific, and I hope I never do, um, you know, just total respect for getting back out there and getting on with life. 
I mean, six months in hospital and they're having to re-injure you all the time, you know, taking other parts off to stick on the other parts. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, that must be just, you know, the pain that you must have experienced. How did you deal? How did you even contemplate going on um, with that yeah, sort of pain the, going? Sorry, the, um, the bandage changes were the worst. Um, the, a, a lot of the pain, I was drugged up to the eyeballs practically yep. initially. So nothing really occurred to me for a long time. Um, yeah, just the bouts of the bandage changes every two days. Um, oh. And then... Then I was just itching, you know, after a few months, I was just sitting in the hospital bed every day and all I had was my TV and chocolates and, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know visitors and things. And I was like, God, I'm, you know, I knew I was going to get out of the hospital and go to rehab and I'd be out home in a few months. So I started thinking, I was like, well, I can't, obviously I can't run. No. Um, I can't get on my bike yet, but... Surely I can sit on my ass and kayak. So I booked a seven-day kayak trip from the hospital bed. <laughs> like, I love it. That's awesome. Preempting that I'd be out in time, and I was. And yeah. I went down with a friend, Andrew, and we kayaked down the sort of the south from Melaleuca for seven days, and it was great. And I just needed that. I just you needed a goal. Um, you needed something to work towards. Yeah. And I'm so stubborn, and I just refused um, to let it beat me. And I wanted my life back. Um, and initially, it, all I wanted to do was run again, and I could maybe do that if I have a below knee amputation. But with all the testing I've done, just with a partial foot amputation, it is really hard. Yes, yeah. So if you've got no rollover and stuff, yeah, exactly. So, yep. and I think because um, my prosthetist explained to me because there's not many partial foot amputees in the world compared to below knee or above knee. So there's all these great prosthetics out there. I could strap on and yep. get going, you know, the next day, but partial foot, there's not that the technology's not there. The options aren't there. Got you. Yeah. But for me, I feel, well, mm. Mm. I'll just keep going. I love being out in the bush and walking and there's so much and mountain biking and, doing all that I'll oh, just keep yeah. going until, until if it yeah. bugs me that much I have that option there but yeah I mean that's, that's that's psychologically a huge thing to even have to consider you know um having something like that chopped off I mean it's a part of you it's a part of your your body you know you don't give up that you know give things up that easily you know <laughs> no that, that's how I feel that's yeah how I feel well even like when I you know um in the last year I had a journey with my hormones and tremors and things in my uterus and you know they think just chop it out just chop it out what's the problem <laughs> just chop the bloody thing out you don't need it you could survive without it and it was to me that that is not an option you know and I went through a, a really you know bad 18 months of just well I bled basically for 12 months too much information but um, to the point that I was having infusions every five days and I would still refuse to have that removed because it's a part of me. And, yeah. and they, they, it's easy for the doctors to say, take it out. But, um, I mean, I did my research. I went and looked into everything and, you know, you can have prolapses, you can have this, that and the other thing happen. It hasn't got to the root cause. I wanted to find out what the root cause was in my case. Um, and, and I did, and I have, and I've still got it, you know, and I didn't have to have it out, you know? Yeah. Um, and too many times, I think, we're just told, chop it off, fuse it, you know, my back. They said, fuse my back when I, when I broke my back when I was young. And I said, no, not having it fused. And you know, thank goodness I didn't, you know. Um, got other issues with it, but it's not that bad. I didn't need to have it, you know. It, 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 things like that, I think, should be always very well thought through at least not just uh, chop it yeah. off because the, the... I, I agree and my surgeons can't understand why I, I I'm not considering it and I'm sure if I said yeah let's get a below knee amputation they would do an amazing job yeah but then that I'd end up going to see a prosthetist and I might have trouble down the track exactly. so we yep. and I know people with trouble with their gait and, and trouble with just constant sores and all that. So, yep. yes, the amputation might be fine, but it's all, all, all the consequences of it. And that's that... what they don't tell you necessarily because what I've, what I've found in my journey is that surgeons want to do surgery. Yes, and they yeah, don't I agree. Actually, they, they pass you on to the rehab once you're through that surgery. They don't even see the 
you know, the consequences or when it goes yeah. wrong or anything else. It's, you know, so, yeah, I think fight till the bitter end, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's now, what, uh, seven, what are we, seven years on? How, yes. How, how yes. did it uh, impact you as a person, confidence-wise, and like, you know, having having burns and scars and and parts of your body missing and uh, disability. Well, you hate the word disability with your hands, um, you know, and all these sort of things. How did it impact you as a person, uh, self-esteem-wise, confidence-wise? Yeah, um, I really struggled, and I kept it to myself being I guess a private person and everything and I felt ugly I felt useless I just like I had a shaved head I had scarring I yeah. had to uh, carry a because I had my left foot amputated a little while after my accident so I had that tubing on medical tubing for eight months I had to wear so then I couldn't wear jeans so I wore tracksuit pants and I just overall felt crap um, unattractive and crap yeah 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 and then so I couldn't exercise um I got my license taken off me until oh. further notice because well I lost mm. my half my foot and um yeah. my fingers mm. um so all I was these, at home all these was, things people don't think about eh? the consequences eh? The, yeah, the ongoing yeah. consequences yeah and so I guess the only the shining light was my, I guess, my stubbornness and that I am going to get back to everything I was doing, which, I mean, it hasn't been the case, but I've done, got back to most things. So, you know, I started just slowly walking and then getting on the mountain bike and, and, and then I went a bit nuts and, and <laughs> some some things I can't do anymore. Like, really, I don't handle the heat very well. Yeah. Um, yep. And that was, that was another thing. One of my goals before my accident I wanted to do marathon de Saab and so oh, I thought in my wisdom yeah. oh, I'll, I'll give this a go and to me <laughs> to do this event was a bit of a nod to yeah I'm back in action Kate's back a- absolutely because so, it's a mean race man it's a tough yeah, one yeah <laughs> but it I struggled but I'd paid maybe ten thousand dollars by the yeah. time you get to the start like accommodation and flights and compulsory gear and I was going to finish that damn event if I had to crawl (laughs) I was just that that was it yeah um but it was a bit too much for me it was just what 40 to 50 degrees no wind no shade no trees it's just um but I finished and I can't say I enjoyed myself I had (laughs) diarrhea and I was throwing up and Uh, but I'm glad I did it yeah, because um, you're back, you know, like you've proven that you can come from where you were completely down on the ground, yeah. absolutely smashed physically and mentally. And, and to do something like that is a big finger uh, to, to the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did it, man. I'm back. <laughs> and that's just a wonderful, wonderful achievement. Yes, obviously it was not easy in the, the temperatures, temperature regulation and all the rest of it. Um, you'd have had to deal with things that most of us don't have to deal with ever, but you've done it. Yeah. You've done it now. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I didn't have a lot of support from my surgeons and they'd have a glazed look on their face when I would They wouldn't uh, even tell know them. what the hell it meant to run 240 uh, k through the Sahara. Well, I just, I just stopped telling them things because they just have this glazed look on their face. Yeah, just, just, totally get you. Totally. Yeah, but... Yeah. It, listen, it was silly. I think I was at my absolute limit, but and I wouldn't put myself in that position again. But hey, I just felt it. like I needed to do it. it, so, so. it sometimes you need things psychologically, you know. Like um, the listeners will know my mum's journey with her aneurysm, and you yes. know, it, it, again, we came up against doctors just telling us, "You're never going to do anything. She's never going to do anything again. She's not ever going to have any quality of life." And I was like, "Stuff you! I'm going to show yeah. you." And, and and that really fueled the fire, and it's been a two year, two years now, just a, a few days ago, and yeah. we've you know ground, grinded it out like rehab, like and and with no support, and just doing it myself and trying to work it out and stay one step ahead in her recovery, and at seventy six, you know, yeah, um, fantastic. And, and she, she couldn't even push a button. She she had no higher function. She had nothing, you know. And now she's 
we we you know going for a driver's license walking reading writing she's completely normal her speech is normal uh you know she's loving life again and and it's just such a big finger to everyone who told us we couldn't do it um and in for she's going for a driver's license right and because that that was taken off here obviously just like you and that really she she wants the license you know yeah. of course we could we could all drive her around and, you know, she doesn't really need the licence. She wants that and she wants to get it back. And she's went, been, we got the medical for a starters. They finally signed off on the medical. She's back to pre-aneurysm levels on everything as far as all her reactions and strength and everything goes. And then we went for the on-road safety test and she's failed that the first time. So now we're having driving lessons and we're fighting, fighting, <laughs> fighting, you know, because... And my brothers look at me, I know, they're all going, what the hell, why are you doing this? Why don't you just, you know, and they can't, I mean, she couldn't, you know, but they said she can't even walk across the lounge, you know, like, how is she going to ever drive a car? And I said, because that, that was a long-term goal, even when she couldn't walk, you know, we're going to yeah. get there. Um, and we will get there, and it and might take five times testing, I don't care what it takes, we'll, we'll get there, because she wants it, and it's her goal. And it's going to be hard, you know, but we'll get there. And, and it, it's it's a step back to her old self. Yes. And that yes. independence and that, you know, like, I'm back. And that's exactly what you were describing there with the Marathon de Sables. And that's, you know, don't write people off. You know, don't no. write them off. It, the mind, if you if you have a strong mind, like you obviously have an extremely strong mind, then the world's still your oyster, you know, there's everything, every possibility of anything you want to do, you know. Oh, definitely. And I, I'm glad that, yeah, there's um stubborn minds out there like you and your mum. <laughs> yeah. Because if, if someone says, you know, even if there's a hint of, oh, you can't do this or you shouldn't be doing this, I just can't help but go, watch me. <laughs> yeah, same way. I just so, watch me. Watch me. I love that. I love that. And especially, you know, you, why do we have to fight so hard in the, against the medical profession? I mean, I'm not saying all doctors are bad and, God, we need them. Yeah. Um, however, it does seem to this be, be this pervading don't create any hope. You know, God forgive you give anybody hope. Or, yeah. or I know they've got to, you know, cover their backsides or whatever. <laughs> But, you know, you, you take away people's hope. You take away their chance of having, having something back or fighting back. And I, and I work now because I, um, uh, I did something called hyperbaric oxygen therapy with my mum, which was her miracle. And then I opened a hyperbaric oxygen therapy clinic and I've worked with stroke patients um, and cancer patients and, and, and um, you know, lots of people with, with you know, big problems. Yeah, and I'm surprised again and again. I spend most of my time counselling. You know, I spend most of my yeah. time saying, "Don't give up. Keep fighting. Do this. Throw everything at it." I don't know whether it will help you in your situation necessarily, but hey, hey you're alive. You should be fighting. You know, give give everything. Throw everything at it. Because what have you got? Yeah. What's the alternative? You know, uh, we we make our lives, I think, so comfortable. You know, like. Mum was told, you know, I'll put mum in a rest home, make her comfortable. Oh, stuff comfortable, you know. <laughs> and people will, like, criticise you the whole time because, well, you're pushing her so hard. Don't put her through mm -hmm. all this torturous rehabilitation. You, if, to me, in my mind, you either pay the price of, of discipline and, and, and physio and, and, you know, training now, or you pay the price of having no life. And that's a worse pr price to pay. You know, and, and yes, we could have done all of the training and it, was still, it could have been all for nothing. She could have still been where she was. But I'd rather have chucked everything at it and given her a chance at coming back than, than not, you know. Exactly right. And then you sort of identify if you've got a, a chronic illness or something. And, you know, I, so technically I am disabled um, because I Apparently. have lost my, my foot and everything. But I don't identify myself as that. No, and no. I... I was in talks with the Australian Paralympic Committee at one stage and I went to one of their training days for, um, oh, what's the word, a gun shooting of all things. It was like mm -hmm. rifle range or something. <laughs> and there was a lot of people in wheelchairs and they, they'd had back um, or quadriplegics and, and paraplegics and they dedicate their life to this sport because that is really one of the big focuses that they have. They can't get out like mm. me. Yeah. And then I chose then and there. Yep. I don't want to identify as disabled. It's like these I just 
I don't know. I had a choice of uh, I'm either disabled or I'm not. I can't I can't be both, and yep. I just choose not choose to be. Choose not to be. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. And, and and to be to be honest, you know, like all of us have got something. So what do you who, what do you say? Like where do you draw the line at the so called disabled? Um, yes. You know who's really you know. I think it's all relative. You know. Um, it's it's how you it's how you identify yourself and how you you see yourself that counts, and if you don't identify as that, then you know, I think yeah. that's important. Um, but saying that, if there was a disabled category on the ultra marathons, I think I'd do quite well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do, do you realise what what you just even even saying that in the same sentence, ultra yeah. marathons? <laughs> People just don't compute. They're like, what, what? Actually, yeah. I've got I've got coming on the the show in in a in a week or two's time. Um, a guy, Ian Walker, who who I admire totally. He's someone that I've just you know followed over the years on social media and he's um, a tetraplegic. Um, so, so from like, he, he's, no, he's got, he's got his arms. So what do you call that? From the middle of the chest down anyway. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and he does uh, ultra marathons uh, with the, with the wheelchair, you know, with the um, arm chair wow. thing and yeah. marathons and, and uh, he's just so cool. And, yep. you know, I've seen him in a videos like fighting to go along on these parallel bars. He's got to the point where with all these braces he can, t you know, drag his foot along and he's determined, you know, um, to, to keep as much strength in his body because you never know what technology is going to do, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. And I just said, wow, what a wonderful person, what an amazing dude, you know, and he's positive and he's fighting yeah. forward, um, you know. Those are the people that, for me, to me, are heroes. You know that that the people like you, the people that just like my mum, that just don't give up, despite what all the crap that life threw at them. They haven't given up. Well, um, that's the thing. This life is amazing, and I just want to pack in as much as I can. So I'm not going to let any little, you know, little incident or or little bump in the road stop me <laughs> because I have so much to do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and you know, get on with life now and 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 flourish and and keep doing. And you've got something coming up very soon. Tell us about that, the next challenge. So you would know about this event. Yep. It's So the Alps to Ocean in um, the South Island of New Zealand, the Ultra Marathon. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's New Zealand's first multi-day yep, Ultra Marathon. Yep. So very excited. And my competitive self, I have a habit of signing up to things and worrying about the details later. <laughs> I don't even look at them. It's a good attitude. I love it. Yeah. And I was emailing the race director and um, just to see if I could make the cutoffs because now I can't run, of course. Mm. And he said, yeah, yeah, you'll be fine. Just letting you know there's only five spots left. So being my competitive self, I was like, oh, no, I've, I've got to get one of those spots. <laughs> so I signed up then and there. and um, <laughs> Work out the rest later. Didn't even know what month that was, what island it was on. Yeah, you know, <laughs> just Minor details. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I can't wait. I've been to the South Island. The oh, scenery awesome. is spectacular. So it'll be great. Yeah, it, it is great. And the guy who's running it, he's, he's so well organised. And we're training a lot of the athletes through our um, um, Running Out Coaching, my online training uh, academy. Yeah. Um, and we've got lots of lots of the athletes there are training under us, and it's really really cool. And they're all nervous as hell, and they're all like, "Oh my god, are we going to make it?" You know. Yeah. And we well, might be sh end up sharing a tent with some of them. Oh, you will, you will. Yep, you you definitely will. There's there's some cool people coming, and it's going to be a really cool event. And, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to it unfortunately, um, but um, we have a bit of a connection to the Alps to Ocean because we were planning on doing a 330k race there um, for charity. Uh, a couple yeah. of years ago with my friend Samuel Gibson who was uh, had uh, brittle bones disease and he wanted to roll it while I ran it with uh, me and my husband and, and my business partner and unfortunately he, he was killed in, a, in an accident um, oh. during training for this this expedition that we were done do uh, he fell out of his wheelchair during a half marathon and hit his head and because he had brittle bones oh. bones disease of course that that was the end. Um, so I have a little awesome. bit of a connection to the Alps to Ocean um, in that respect. And, and, I, and I think uh, it's wonderful that they've picked this beautiful part of New Zealand to make this multi-day stage race. So hopefully you guys go really, really well. Yeah, I just I can't wait. <laughs> oh, it's going to be awesome. You'll be, you'll be, you're such an inspiration. I, have you written a book yet? Like, what are you doing? Oh, no. 
No, I, 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 being a private, I like to fly under the radar. So, um, <laughs> oh, sorry, that's just finished because you just come on my podcast. And yeah, I know. That's, that's, yeah, I've done, I've done very few sort of anything in the media and whatever. But yeah. you know, I'm, I like it that way. Yeah, so, fair enough. Yeah, I totally get it. But the thing is, I think you need to consider this: the fact that you are such an inspiring individual, and you know, in some way that sharing your story will inspire and help other people, you know. So whether you like it or not, you're a bit of a leader, <laughs> you know, you're a bit of a leader. Your story is, is amazing. And, you know, I, I get that you're private and you're an in, introverted person and stuff, but, yeah, you might have to rethink that eventually because you, you've, yeah. got, you've got so much to teach and to share, you know. You know what I mean? Yeah, thank you. Well, I guess I've started by being on the podcast with you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll come back and I'll interview you in five years' time and you'll probably, you know, done all those things. So, or you can come on my podcast and I uh, have. Excellent. <laughs> I'll be very honoured to do that. Yeah, no, yeah. look, when you get well going, that's what we'll do. But Okay, hey, awesome. Hey, look, it's been so wonderful talking to you, Kate. I really thank you for your, your honesty and your openness. And I, and I know, you know, it, it's very hard to share your vulnerabilities, your the honest truth of, of your life. Um, I do it all the time, so I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, get it out there. It might help somebody. And that's, uh, that's I think, what's, what, what really counts. Someone out there yeah. listening to this today needed to hear what you have to say. So thank you very much for your, for your openness. No, thank you for having me. So any, any parting words before we go, any words of wisdom and advice for, for anyone out there that's uh, contemplating having to go at something or fighting through an injury themselves or yeah, oh, dealing with I've, some, I've, some issues? When I'm out on the trail, I have always, my little mantra is tough times don't last, tough people do. <laughs> and so when you're down in the dumps or you're having a hard time, you just sort of, that's my little, my go-to. Yep. But, geez, just turn up on that start line would, would, be, would be something and just run your own race. Don't compare yourself to other people. Yeah. Just, yeah, and, and you'll see turning up to the start line is the hardest part and the rest is easy. Yeah. Don't think, yeah. just do. Work exactly. Out and work, you know, sign up and work it out later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my motto. <laughs> that's what I do too. And I always get myself in the poo doing that. <laughs> Oh, I didn't realise it was going to be that hard. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, geez, I better train. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the best motivation, that's for sure. Hey, Kate, <laughs> thank you so, so much for your time today. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to hearing how you do at the Alpster Ocean. Thank you very much. Wanted to let you guys know about my new Mindset Academy. It's called The Path of an Athlete, and it's all about how to develop mental toughness, resilience, leadership skills, how to overcome those limiting beliefs, those self-doubts that we all have, and how you can achieve your dreams and fulfill your potential. So head on over to lisatamati.co.nz forward slash e-course to find out all about it and get involved. That's it for this episode of Pushing the Limits with your host, Lisa Tamati. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe, and share all this goodness with your networks so we can impact more lives with positive insights and inspiring conversations. And check us out online at www.lisatamati.co.nz. That's it for this episode of Pushing the Limits with your host, Lisa Tamati. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe and share all this goodness with your networks so we can impact more lives with positive insights and inspiring conversations. And check us out online at www.lisatamati.co.nz.